Uh, welcome everyone to uh, the fifth UQM virtual seminar. Um, it's a great pleasure to introduce you our speakers today, Ryan Thorngren from Harvard and Wen Ji Ji from MIT. Uh, so our first speaker is Ryan and uh, he will tell us about a symmetry principle for boundaries of topological order. Ryan, take it away. Thank you, Hassan, and thanks everyone for showing up. So I'm going to tell you about mostly, mostly about this project that uh, hasn't appeared yet, but there will also be significant overlap with this work with Yifan Wang. So th these are my collaborators. These are the, the team from Israel. We have uh, Suf Lichtman, who is a master's student at, at Weizmann. And of course, you know, Adi Erez and Natanel and Yifan Wang is another postdoc at CMSA. And so this is, this is one of the references here on the archive. There's going to be part two that will be about C equals one CFTs and, and their special symmetries. So the topic of this talk is boundary conditions of topological phases. One can think about a boundary condition as coming from say a hetero structure, perhaps like this, where one has a topological phase occupying some part of the structure and then one has some other kind of material, perhaps a, a trivial insulator or maybe a metal, and then something else over here. And where we have these junctions between different phases, what this looks like, it looks like a boundary condition from the topological phase. And where you have two junctions joining, you might have something that looks like a quantum mechanical system describing these boundary condition changing operators here. We want to understand the physics of these systems. We want to understand these boundary conditions. So topological phases, are traditionally understood in terms of their anions, these quasi-particles with interesting grading and fusion rules. And if you, have, if you have a description in terms of anions, what you can do is you can think about anion condensates. So we can imagine other gaps phases that would be obtained from this topological phase by taking one anion and then giving it, giving it a VEV. And that would confine anions that braid with this one of course, anions that are part of the condensate would be now a trivial particle. And, but there's some, maybe some anions left over. And this would yield a boundary condition of this topological phase where we can say that the anions in this condensate, from the perspective of this phase, they're condensed on the boundary. And it turns out that for non-chiral phases, these anion condensates describe all of the boundary conditions of the theory. So there's already a complete theory of gapped boundaries of topological phases. But let's suppose we want to tune parameters in these regions. So for instance, we could have a phase transition from one condensate into another, and that would look like a gapless boundary condition. And there's much less theory developed for those. And in terms of the condensates, it's actually quite hard to think about what order parameters one, one should consider from, to study a transition from some condensate to another. So what we're going to do is we're going to formulate another point of view on these boundary conditions. What we're going to do is we're going to define a one-dimensional system that's associated with the boundary condition, and it will have an unbreakable symmetry that's associated with the algebraic data of these anions with their fusion rules. And the correspondence goes that the boundary conditions are, are in one-to-one -one correspondence with just one dimensional systems, but with this special symmetry. One can think of this as akin to symmetry protected topological phases or SPT phases. Their boundary conditions are the same thing as theories with a symmetry with a particular anomaly. So this is very much gonna be the same kind of uh, statement, but now applies to topological phases with anions and ground state degeneracy. So I'll just remind you that uh, the difference between chiral and non-chiral phases essentially is that, that chiral phases don't have gapped boundaries. There's always some Hall current, always, always some kind of chiral gapless mode on the edge. Meanwhile, non-chiral phases, for instance, these string nets. So a string net is a 
is a, is a theoretical model for a general non-chiral phase where one imagines that the, that the ground state is a sum over pictures of these soups of strings. The strings have certain labels and there's rules for these, these junctions or the, which, which labels can have a junction. And these always have a gapped boundary condition because one can impose this fixed boundary condition where you say that no strings meet the boundary. So this is clearly a boundary condition, it's clearly gapped. So it turns out that all non-chiral phases are described by these string nets. Um, to develop our symmetry principle, we're going to need to use a gapped boundary as a reference state to study other boundaries. So this is why we restrict ourselves to non-chiral phases first. It may be possible to develop this theory with a reference, say, gapless boundary, but we're not going to pursue that. So essentially, we restrict ourselves to the string net models. There's this general non-chiral case. OK, so like I said, we're going to go from our boundary condition, and we're going to create a one-dimensional system. And the way we create this, this one-dimensional system is that we take, our, we take the system on a cylinder. The cylinder has two edges. On the bottom edge, we're going to put our reference gapped boundary condition, which is going to be fixed. Once we fix it, it's fixed for all time. And then on the other side, we're going to have the physical edge where we're allowed to tune parameters. This could be a gapless boundary. It could be a critical point or multi-critical point between different boundary conditions, whatever it is. And we're going to choose this special geometry. So the circumference is going to be the longest length. And it's going to be much longer than the width here. And the width is going to be still larger than the bulk correlation length. So these edges are going to be essentially decoupled. But we're going to consider this as our one dimensional direction, the circumference here. OK, so in these systems, the most important operators are the string operators, which ferry our anions from place to place. So one can think about the string operator that goes around the system, what it does is it takes this anion A and it brings it around. Or maybe more precisely, you could think about it as creating a pair of A and its antiparticle pair, A star, and then brings them around and they annihilate on the other side. So these string operators satisfy, as operators, they multiply according to the fusion rules of the anions, because you can think of a product of two string operators on top of each other, it's varying a pair of anions together, and the pair of anions obey the fusion rules. So you can think about the, the product of them as a sum of, of other anions. So that's this fusion rule here. Now, the geometry implies that the two kinds of string operators, open and closed, meaning the ones that go along the width and the ones that go along the circumference, have different, uh, they're, they're different they're different sizes in the sense that the open string operator is like a local operator from the 1D point of view because it only occupies a small region in, this, in the circumference. So we consider that to be a local operator, whereas an operator that goes all the way around the system is going to be a global operator. And actually, these string operators, because the, they capture only the topological aspects of the quasi-particle braiding, they are topological operators. So this string, we get the same operator if we put it here or if we deform it a little bit. And we can also do such deformations in space time. And what we learn is that these operators have to correspond to symmetries. Having a topological operator is actually the same as having a symmetry generator. And that's a, it's a technical point that I'd be happy to discuss in questions, but I need to move on for now. So the summarize these, uh, these open string operators are local operators. These closed string operators define symmetries. So let's suppose our reference boundary condition is an anion condensate, as all the gap boundary conditions are anion condensates. So we'll say that some subset n of the total set of anions m is condensed. Then what can happen is you can have a string operator where an anion in N comes out of the boundary and then returns to the boundary. And those, those string operators are topological. They can be freely moved. So if we have one of these 
closed string operators that is ferrying an anion around, if that anion is in the condensate, it can take a detour through the through the edge. So it can it can go into the into the reference boundary condition here, and then maybe come out over here, or it could come out over here, or over here. You can unwind any closed string operator that's associated with an anion in N. So these operators are trivial in the in the low energy system we're describing. They're like gauge symmetries. On the other hand, anions which are which say braid with other anions in the condensate, so which are confined here, they cannot freely end because they're confined. It costs some energy to end there. So it's not going to be an, an operator that we can use to unwind the closed string. So these are actually going to define non-trivial operators. So what happens is that the operators which braid, sorry, the anions which, uh, which are not in the condensate, close into some fusion algebra A, and this fusion algebra is going to act as a global symmetry. This determines the fusion rules of these string operators, and these are going to be global symmetry operators. So from a boundary condition, we've constructed a 1D system with a certain fusion algebra as a global symmetry. And there's a converse to this statement as well, which was, I think, first explored in this paper. And we also talked about it with Yifen. So let's do an example. In the Tor code, it's probably the simplest topological order, there are, are two bosons, which we'll call E and M, which are allowed to condense. There's also a fermion, but it's not allowed to condense. So let's, let's take the reference boundary condition to be the E condensate. If we take the M condensate, it'll be a dual story. So in this case, the M closed string is the one that defines a non-trivial operator because M, this string cannot end on the E condensate because M braids with E. And because of the fusion rule, M squares to one, this defines a Z2 global symmetry. So what we're saying is that boundary conditions of the Tor code, once you choose this reference boundary condition are in one-to-one -one correspondence with 1D systems with just a global Z2 symmetry. So for instance, study gapped boundary conditions. We have to study Z2 gapped phases hey, and there are two. Brian, excuse yes. me. Hi, uh, can, can, can I, uh, this is Shuhan. Can I go back to the previous slide? Absolutely. Thank you. Um, I just want to make sure that when you say um, classify boundary conditions of the Tori code by classifying one D system with global Z2 symmetry. You mean Z2 symmetry without number? That's right. That's okay. right. That's a good. That's a good question. I'll I'll get, I'll get to that too. There's a there's a twisted Tor code as well, and those but boundary okay. conditions would would have the anomaly. Okay. So thanks. Right. So the the symmetry that we get, we get an we get the whole fusion algebra. So this is a technical point. It it. Uh, describes the anomaly of the global symmetry as well, just like with SPTs. Okay, anyway, so the, the two gap phases for the C2 symmetry are symmetric and symmetry breaking. And we want to, say, we want to ask uh, which, which condensates correspond to which. It turns out that the E condensate corresponds to the symmetry breaking phase. And the way you can see this is we take our cylinder geometry and we have the E condensate on both the reference edge and the physical edge. And now what can happen is we can have one of these open string operators where an E particle from the top edge tunnels to the bottom edge. And this is going to be a topological operator because E is in, in both condensates. We can have pairs of these, can move it around. So this operator has a VEV. Moreover, because of the braiding rules, it anti-commutes with our global symmetry because M and E braid. So because this has a VEV, we, we, we see that our Z2 symmetry is spontaneously broken. So in this way, the E condensate corresponds to the symmetry breaking phase. The M condensate would correspond to the symmetric phase because then this M string can freely end on the M condensate. And there's no way to, there's nothing we can tunnel from the E condensate to the M condensate. So there's a unique ground state. So, the general story is like that for gapped phases. One has the, the reference condensate N, and then one has some other condensate on the top. And any anion that can tunnel between the condensates is going to give us an order parameter that uh, is going to imply some 
some symmetry breaking for these global symmetries. And one might also have to study the properties of non-local order parameters uh, to study like SPT-like phases. And anyway, one finds that uh, the classification for gapped boundaries is just in indirect correspondence with the classification of symmetric phases, symmetric gap phases for, for these, uh, for this algebra. So that's, that's um, classic stuff. So generalizing the Tor code example is quite easy. So there's a, there's a topological phase for every finite group and every three co-cycle on that group. And what we find, if you put this through the, through the machinery, is that there is a bijection between boundary conditions of this gauge theory and systems with just a global symmetry, but with a particular anomaly that's determined by this omega. So in other words, there are boundaries of an SPT that's determined by this co-cycle. And the SPT is related to the topological order by gauging the symmetry. So this whole construction, choosing the reference boundary condition and putting it on the cylinder geometry is a way to ungauge the symmetry at the boundary. So you can think of it this way. We can also study domain walls of general phases. So domain walls between the phase and itself by moving to this torus geometry. So torus geometry, what we would do, so we would have our maybe chiral phase on the surface of this torus, and then a domain wall on top that we're interested in studying. This is where we're gonna tune our parameters. And then some reference domain wall on the bottom, which we may as well choose to be the trivial domain wall. So that it's not even there. So it's just this torus with a single domain wall running around one cycle. This can be mapped to the cylinder that we just discussed by flattening. You sort of flatten in this middle direction here. And what happens is the domain wall ends up on top where we had our physical edge. And on the bottom, we have this fold boundary condition. So in the bulk here, it's like the double of this phase. And the reference boundary condition will be this fold boundary condition. So the reason I bring this up is because I want to talk about this very interesting example. Um, one way to, uh, so the Kataev honeycomb model is a, is a 2D model of spins on a hexagonal lattice, and it has a non-abelian chiral phase. The whole model admits an exact solution once you pass to so we, Majorana and gauge variables. And the way this mapping works, it's important to point out that if we have a uh, the Majorana operators are not exactly local. If we have this product of spin operators like so, then it's equivalent to having a Majorana operator at J0 near J0 and a Majorana operator near Jn, but they're connected by this Wilson loop of the Z2 gauge variables. But anyway, the Z2 gauge variables don't play a very important role. One can diagonalize them and then solve the resulting problem for the Majoranas. And if you do this in the non-abelian phase, you find that the Majoranas are in this P-wave superconducting state. This state famously has a chiral edge mode, a single chiral Majorana on its edge, central charge one half. And indeed, when you look at the, the model of the spins, the whole honeycomb model, it also has a chiral edge mode of C equals a half. Now the question is, what happens when we take two of these edges and we place them side by side. So one, one way of obtaining this situation is taking the honeycomb model and simply cutting out a line of bonds. And so that will produce an edge here and an edge here and they'll be decoupled. So there will be some chiral mode. Um, I drew it going to the right on this edge and going to the left on this edge. From the from the p-wave superconductor point of view we might expect that any interaction between these two edges will generate a mass term for the majorana and once we have that mass term the domain wall will be all immediately gapped out however this doesn't happen the mass term ends up not being local 
in the spin variables of the honeycomb model, which means it cannot be generated by any, any, any way that you couple these, these two edges together, you won't generate the mass term. And the mass is the only, is the only relevant operator of this effective Majorana field. So since it's not allowed, this domain wall is actually stable to all small enough perturbations, we'll still have these chiral modes here. So this is a, a stable gapless phase in the phase diagram of domain walls. So we want to, we want to understand this. Um, one way is that, as we said, the, the Majoranas, you can make them out of the spin variables, but they end up living at the endpoints of these Wilson lines. And we can't write a bilinear of a, uh, of a Majorana at one edge and a Majorana at the other edge because one string is going into the, into the top half of the system and the other string is going into the bottom half of the system. And it turns out they can't cross without making more Majoranas at the endpoints. So the smallest operator you can make out of the Majoranas has four of them. And that tells us the most relevant perturbation is this four Fermi operator of dimension four. This was studied, for instance, by this group. And they found that with a large enough perturbation, large enough coefficient, this perturbation eventually gaps out the domain wall and it passes through a, a C equals seven tenths critical point along the way. One way to encode these locality rules, which is nice, is to say that we need to preserve the chiral fermion parity. So we need to have the same number of gamma lefts as gamma right. So as we have in this four Fermi operator. And the reason is that gamma rights are coming from one side and they need to pair up with their strings and the gamma lefts from the other side uh, come from the other side and they also need to pair up with their strings. But we want to understand the a symmetry principle from our abstract arguments that I outlined. So what we need to do is we need to go to the non-chiral phase and we do that by folding over this domain wall. And what we end up we end up with this non-chiral Ising string net model now. The reference boundary condition is just this fixed boundary condition. And at the top, we have some kind of C equals half boundary condition that we want to study. So if we look at the algebra here, this is the, the fusion algebra that defines the Ising string net is going to act as a global symmetry of this edge. And this is what that looks like. So it has some fusion rules has some associativity relations. We're mostly interested in these fusion rules. So for instance, if we look at this one, it says that epsilon squared is one. That means that this epsilon anion corresponds to a string with just Z2 fusion rules. So it defines an ordinary Z2 global symmetry. So this boundary condition has some Z2 symmetry. But then there's this other anion. The sigma is more interesting. It's not abelian. It can't really be described as a group-like symmetry. Instead, what it does is it's, it squares to something which, which looks like a projection operator. It's actually two times a projection operator. So if we think about epsilon as our symmetry operator, if I just call it G, then the projection onto G even states looks like one half quantity one plus G. So that's like what we have here. It's like sigma squared is two times a projector. So it turns out that this fusion rule is related to Kramer's Wanya duality. So what we're going to say is that this edge is now non-chiral C equals a half. We're going to describe it as the Ising CFT. And we're going to say that these two symmetries, the Z2 symmetry is going to be the ordinary Z2 symmetry of the Ising CFT. And this extra symmetry coming from the sigma line is Kramer's Wanya duality of the Ising CFT. So, so Ryan, in this model, the Frobenius squared indicator is one. That's right. Thank you. In what sense is it a symmetry? Is it not the? It's a global symmetry. Um, does, it, does it act on the Hilbert space? Yes. It's not invertible. In this case, it's not invertible, yeah. But it's an operator, it commutes with the Hamiltonian and all of that. There's a topological 
yeah, so this, this, is a t this defines some topological line operator, if you like. It just doesn't have group-like fusion rules, but we're going to think about it as a symmetry. Okay, so let, let's talk about why this fusion rule has anything to do with Kramer's one. I'm, I'm, I'm still puzzled by that. I okay. learned in school that the symmetries are associated with groups. <laughs> That's fine. You can, you can take that point of view, but then you should come up with some other name for, for this. But so this uh, is not I'm a just going to call it a symmetry. This is not really a symmetry in the standard. The Hilbert space is not in a representation. The Hilbert space is in a representation, but it's a representation of this algebra. So it's just it's just a little bit different. I I guarantee you it's not that much different from uh, the symmetries you know and love. But it's a little more fun. Okay, so this fusion rule is related to Kramer's Wanda duality. And I'm just gonna spend a minute on that. So what you can do is you can think about, and this, is an, this is an argument I learned from, from these fellows, you can think about the torus partition function. So this square is supposed to be a torus. So I've just drawn it as a square, but you need to identify the top and the bottom edge and the left and the right edge so that you get a torus. And the first rule we're allowed to invoke is we're, we're allowed to make a small loop of the sigma string, which I've drawn in red here, at the cost of dividing the, the result by the quantum dimension, which in this case is square root two. So this is our first equality. And then what we're going to do is we're going to take this string and we're going to bring it around the back of the torus and fuse it with itself. And the result is this. By the fusion rules, there are two ways it can fuse with itself. So we end up getting two terms and there's some numerical factors associated with using this fusion rule. And the two terms are whether we end up with a vacuum line here, just, a, just no line at all, or with this epsilon line. So I've drawn the epsilon line with these dots. And then we're gonna do the trick again. We're going to bring the, the red line around the top of the torus and annihilate on the backside. And now there's gonna be four terms because now there's two times two choices for whether you have the epsilon there or not. And actually, this uh, this red bubble, we can we could pull it off and and cancel it again, and just get this simple identity. And what this identity says is that the torus partition function, the usual torus partition function, is equal to the sum over these four partition functions. These are the four different ways of taking the epsilon loop and wrapping the torus with it. So, in in other words, the right hand side here is the partition function after we've gauged the Z2 symmetry. So any theory that has this Ising fusion algebra as a symmetry is actually equivalent to itself under gauging a Z2 symmetry. And I don't know how, no, how known it is, but this is, this is the same as the, as the kramer zwani duality of, of the Ising CFT. And one way to see that is to take this right-hand side and Think about what it says. So on the, if we group these into two terms, the first term is projecting out all of the Z2 odd operators. So it projects out the spin operator, leaving the, leaving the identity operator and the, and the thermal operator. Whereas these next two terms takes the Z2 even parts of the twisted sector. And in the twisted sector, there's three operators. There's two fermions, which are Z2 odd and get projected out. And there's a disorder operator, which has the same, has, has all the same um, data as the spin operator. So this equality, all it's really saying is that the spin and the disorder operator are equivalent, which is the usual kramer zwani duality. And if we think about kramer zwani duality of the Ising CFT, we think about it as, we want to think about it as a symmetry. So we've said that boundary conditions are going to be the same as just studying these 1D systems with, with this global symmetry is never broken. So we think about relevant perturbations of, of the Ising CFT. There are two of them. There's the transverse magnetic field. This is forbidden by the usual Z2 symmetry. And that's just associated with epsilon, this abelian anion. But it also has this thermal operator that perturbs into the ordered or the disordered phase depending on its sign. Well, Kramer's Wanda duality exchanges the ordered and disordered phases, so this thermal operator is odd. That means that all of the relevant operators of the Ising CFT are forbidden by this fusion algebra symmetry. 
So this is another way to guarantee the stability of the gapless edge. You can actually relate this to the picture in terms of the Majoranas because the Majorana picture and the CFT picture are related by bosonization. And when you work that out, the chiral fermion parities that I mentioned become this kramer zwandy duality. So we actually get an equivalent picture thinking this way. So, um, let's see, do I have time to say this? Maybe I'll say one minute on talking about the gaps domain wall. So once one tunes this four Fermi perturbation to a large enough value and gets this gap domain wall, we should think about that as the trivial domain wall. And so there's, there's two ways of thinking about it. First of all, as, as a Z2 symmetric phase, it has to be invariant under Kramer's Vonnegut duality. So it has to be a superposition of a ferromagnetic and a paramagnetic phase. So it has three ground states. And in terms of the torus, those three ground states correspond with the three anions that you can wrap the torus with in this non-abelian phase. And the C equals seven tenths critical point between them. Like I said, you should study this fusion uh, algebra symmetry, which was studied by these gentlemen. And they found that indeed this C equals seven tenths theory, this tricritical icing point, it has this fusion category symmetry. And moreover, it has a single relevant operator, which is symmetric. And that means it's a good, it's, it's, a, it's exactly a universality class that we would expect generically between this gapless phase and this gas phase. So that's nice and consistent. So I'll just quickly summarize. Choosing a reference gas boundary condition a particular geometry allows us to study our boundary phases just in terms of a 1D problem, but where we have a symmetry and the symmetry is, is never broken. We can also study domain walls by basically folding over the domain wall and mapping us into the, into the non-chiral case. And this uh, surprising stability of the Siegel's half domain wall in the Kataev spin liquid this honeycomb model is straightforwardly explained in terms of a kramer zwane duality that just comes from the fusion rules of the anions. And a little, a little teaser in the, in the forthcoming paper. These were relatively simple and well-known examples, but there are, there are some systems which I think without the symmetry principle be quite lost to try to study them. For instance, in these, uh, even, even something as simple as domain walls in the Torah code, there's an extremely rich phase diagram that is equivalent to this uh, Z2Z2 uh, symmetry and rich criticality case that uh, we studied with Ruben Veresen, Nick Jones, and Frank Bowman. And uh, yeah, let, let me just thank you and end there and move back to my summary slide, take questions. Thank you very much, Ryan. So we have a few minutes for questions. And this is uh, Ashwin, can you hear me? Uh, Ryan? Yes, I'm trying to figure out yeah. how to turn my video back on. Yeah, I had a kind of a question following up on Natty's uh, question about, uh, you know, these are not uh, are conventional symmetries because they don't form a group, right? Right. Uh, but it sounds like there's something more general, some more general way of thinking about, um, you know, symmetries in this context. Um, so, so what replaces the group? Uh, first of all, um, you said it's an algebra, but uh, it, it, can you say a little bit more? Uh, what what structure replaces the group? Yeah. So. Um... First of all, that you have the fusion ring is the, is the first thing that replaces the group. But more precisely, what we have here is we have the group and we also have the anomaly associated with the symmetry. And all of that data is encoded by this fusion category, which is the same data that you get out of the anions. Mm -hmm. you, never lose, you never lose any data in going to the symmetry point of view. Uh, but if you want to just think in terms of we have these operators and they satisfy some multiplication 
I had mm -hmm. it over here. Um, so if you multiply the operator, so I called these operators L, if you just multiply them, they act on the Hilbert space, they will satisfy this relation where these N, these are, these are the integers in the fusion ring. So if this were a group algebra, you would, you would only have one term on the right-hand side and right. that N would be right. one. Mm -hmm. And then you have additional data as well, you said, and you said you have anomalies as well? Or? That's right. So the, we, had, we not only have just the, the fusion rules, we also have the crossing relations. So for instance, here, all these different ways that you can partially fuse are that, so that I didn't talk about uh, the details going on here, but the, the data of like these phases and the, and the signs here, these, these encode the anomalies as well. Mm -hmm. Did you use that in any of the examples you gave just now? Um, seems like you just used the fusion rules for the Kramers by Nair duality. Well, in, in both of the examples that I told you about, the TOR code and for, and, and the Ising case, there are, there are two different, there are two different uh, possibilities for these associativity relations. I, I told you sort of about the trivial case, but in the TOR code, for instance, there's the possibility of a Z2 symmetry having an anomaly, and that would correspond to the, this twisted TOR code, this uh, double semion model. So, Sorry, Ashley. So uh, regarding your question, Ryan did use this fusion rule, this uh, associativity relation in proving uh -huh. that the uh, 1 plus 1D theory with this category is self-dual under Z2. That's that's right. Yeah. So if I did that yeah, here, so there is a there is some some finagling with the with the framing uh, where so I the Ising CFT actually it realizes only one of these categories as its self duality. The other one is realized, say in uh, SU two level two. So it's just a yeah. And the classification of gapped phases would probably be different. Well, not for Ising, because there's only one, which is, you can think of it as the symmetry breaking phase, which you all, always have. But uh, for the Z2, there would be no symmetric phase if you have this anomaly, right? Uh -huh. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Ryan? Yes. This is Max. <laughs> um, I have a question. Uh, so this, um, um, these uh, symmetries, I mean, are, they, are they kind of gauged or not? Uh, do, do, do they have to act as identity on all states? So there's kind of two ways. I think of them as, as not gauged. So they don't, they don't act as the identity on all states. But I think that if you, if you read some related work, like I think what Wenji is going to talk about, then they are more like gauge symmetries where the, the, the charge states are in twisted sectors. But here I'm just trying to not have any twisted sectors and I'm just saying that there's a symmetry. It's just that our local operators are exactly the, the uh, even ones. But so we shouldn't, if we want to get the ground state degeneracy on this torus or on the cylinder, then we should not do any projecting. We should just take it as a global symmetry. Is it the difference between working on a cylinder and a, and a disk? Is that? Yeah, that's that's exactly right. Yeah, so we can if we close this into a disk, then uh, we would project into the uh, symmetric states because you could nucleate a small um, loop here and then and bring it to the boundary, and then your twisted sector states would be inserting a flux through that disk. But here I prefer to work with uh, global symmetries, which is why I introduced this, uh, this reference boundary condition. I see. I'd like to understand a little better the, this notion of a symmetry. This is Nati. Yes. Uh, so in what sense does it map a state to Similar state. Oh, what do you mean similar state? So the notion of a symmetry is that 
you flip, say, left and right, and it looks exactly the same. So if I come from outside uh -huh. and I did not know whether you acted on the symmetry or not, I would not be able to know. Uh -huh. But so it's not that if it commutes with the Hamiltonian, it means that it maps to a, another state with the same energy. Mm -hmm. But in what sense are these states are in a representation of a, of a group or something? In what sense are they really symmetric? So I don't, you, you probably can't think about it as an automorphism because those are always invertible, but it does, we do get a map from states to states and it does commute with the Hamiltonian. And if you look at this fusion ring, this implies certain, that there are certain eigenvalues of these operators. So for instance, if we study the, if we study the fusion rules for this sigma anion, this uh, sigma squared equals one plus epsilon, we find that the allowed eigenvalues are two, zero and minus two. I'm sorry, square root two, zero, and minus let's square take, root two. Ryan, let's take an extreme example. You have some complicated system, and the Hamiltonian is zero. Uh -huh. Then every operator commutes with the Hamiltonian. Yes. Will you say that every operator is a symmetry? Uh, I would not, because these, these symmetries, these operators are specifically associated with line operators, so they're local, in a, in a sense. And I can even tell you about uh, operators, line operators, which define invertible operators on the Hilbert space, but I would still consider them to be non-invertible symmetries in the sense that there's no inverse line operator. So it's very important that we have line operators because they're going to, you know, it's, it's, they're going to mostly map local operators to non-local, to local operators. It's not going to be like complete mayhem. So I think that if you don't have a Hamiltonian, it's hard to talk about uh, locality, but uh, there really is some important constraint that allows me to th talk about fusion rules and crossing relations and so on. Did that answer your question? I, well, it answered it, yeah. But it's not a satisfactory answer. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So, uh, in the interest of time, uh, let's move on to the next talk.